In quantum mechanics, particles are things we only see when we measure them, but how they move around is described by a wave function, a wave function that satisfies the Schrodinger equation, which I talked about in my last video. It's important to note that wave functions are not unique to quantum mechanics. We use wave functions in many other systems, like the motion of ripples of water, sound waves, vibrations on a string, or electromagnetic waves. And each of these systems has their own wave equation, which all have similarities as they all express the change of the wave function in space and time. But the key difference between all of these waves is that the quantum wave function isn't a real physical wave. There is no medium like water or electromagnetic field that's wobbling. So we can't say that quantum waves are real with our current knowledge because we can't measure them directly. But they do describe the behaviours of quantum particles very well, so there must be something real going on. The question of whether the wave function is real or not is a big question veering into the interpretations of quantum mechanics, so I'll just refer you to my previous video on that subject. But even though we'll never be able to see a quantum wave function, we can do the next best thing and visualise the mathematical equations. So this is what the math says the wave function looks like. These two are mathematically equivalent, although this one's easier to do calculations with. But we'll use this form for this video as it's easier to visualise. This wave function depends on time and one dimension of space, which is a simplification from a real particle which exists in three dimensions of space, but this simplification allows us to plot this function. So let's do that. We'll just plot the first part of this wave function to begin with. This is simply a cosine wave. Note that the k is a variable controlling the size of the wavelength, the omega controls the oscillation frequency, and the prefactor a controls the amplitude. So different parameters will make different waves. Now, to plot the second part of the wave, we're going to need another axis, even though the wave is one-dimensional. This is because the sine part of the wave function is multiplied by the imaginary number i, making it a complex wave function. So here they are, both plotted independently. But if we plot the whole thing together, we get this, a spiral of complex values, which would go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but I'm just plotting a section of it here. This is fixed at one point in time, but if we turn time on we get an oscillation which, in this case, manifests as a winding of the spiral. So that's what a quantum wave function looks like. But what actually is it? It's called a probability amplitude, and isn't anything physical on its own. But if you take the mod squared of the amplitude, it tells you the probability of finding the particle at any point in this one-dimensional space. So we can extract the position of a particle from this wave function. Actually, the wave function doesn't just tell you about the probability of position, but all other measurable physical quantities like momentum or energy or spin. We just need to do different mathematical operations on the wave function for each one. But overall, the wave function is a mathematical tool which keeps track of all of the properties of a quantum particle, and explains our observations of the probabilistic nature of where particles appear when we do experiments on them. So far I've given you one example of a wave function, but there are many other possibilities. They just have to satisfy a set of constraints, which I'll be drawing on one axis for clarity. Firstly, a wave function must be a solution of the Schrodinger equation which I mentioned at the beginning. Secondly, when you calculate a probability from the wave function, you'll get a probability distribution. And the area of this needs to equal 1, because there has to be a definite probability you'll find the particle somewhere. This means that the original wave function can't have an infinite area underneath it. Technically we say that the wave function must be normalizable. So my visualization from earlier is not actually allowed because it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. To be valid, it would have to go to zero as x goes to infinity. Thirdly, the wave function must be single valued. Also, it must be continuous, so have no breaks in it. And the slope of the wave function must be continuous, so no discontinuities in the gradient, like this. So those are the conditions quantum wave functions have to meet. Finally, let's look at superposition. This is a property that's also not unique to quantum mechanics. If you have two sets of ripples on water that overlap, any point will feel the two waves added together, and this is a superposition of waves. In quantum mechanics, if you have two or more wave functions that are valid solutions of the Schrodinger equation, then any combination of these wave functions is also a valid solution. And this is where the idea comes from that Schrodinger's cat can be dead and alive at the same time, although this never actually happens because of other quantum phenomena, entanglement and decoherence. 
These are beyond the scope of this video, but here's an excellent video on the subject from Sabina Hossenfelder for those of you who'd like to delve deeper. This video was made possible thanks to the kind support of my patrons on Patreon and people buying posters from my DFTBA store. I couldn't keep this channel alive without your support. Thanks everyone, and thanks for watching.